But in addressing the point you said about the Christians, I believe the Christians are on the morally high standard. In fact, it represents the gold standard in morality terms, uh, as was the teachings of Jesus. Because your conscience is telling you that this is wrong, but your honour won't let you follow through with the logic. If your conscience is telling you that it's wrong, then chuck your honour away. Because honour is cultivated by man, but conscience is given to you by God. I've seen some of your videos. Yep. Um, I guess the topic is, you know, the, the light that Islam is so sort of painted in. Yeah. Uh, I get the impression... Put it in there, then. When you finish, there you go. There you go, Okay, we just pass it between yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get the impression, I could be wrong. Um, and when I was younger, you know, the kind of Christians I was sort of brought up with, around. Uh, obviously, it's not like Speaker's Corner, so it's more sort of, you know, a relaxed sort of thing. Uh, they don't sort of get aggressive or argue about things. But ever since I come to Speaker's Corner, there's been sort of a focus on certain things. And it's always painted in a very sort of harsh and negative light like the word paedophiles are thrown around and this sort of thing. And you know, brought up in this country um, as a Pakistani. I remember a long time ago, we're talking like before 20 years ago, where racism was sort of worse than it is now. Because uh, I saw like a, let's say I saw a good period of, of quite harsh racism, where you just walk on the streets, someone would spit at you, would say all sorts of things. And then it sort of, it went down to sort of a time when it sort of stopped. But recently it's coming back up that curve again, where people, again on the bus, you're hearing comments, people say things, they do things. So what I'm saying is that Christi Christians or Christianity, is it sort of moving towards a union with the far right? Because I know it's not attacking a race. Islam is a religion. I understand that. But it's just what I'm seeing on the streets. You know, the resurgence of something which I, I remember in my childhood. Except now they just call it like Muslims. They don't say, you know, the words they used to use back then. Like my sister, she got like someone threw a can at her. You know, just for wearing hijab and things. And they say Muslim this, Muslim that. Pedophile, that word is thrown around quite a lot. Can we do 1.1 point? 1 .1 point yeah, then? yeah. So can I I'll let you uh, get the mic. Sorry. So, um, I guess the question is, is the, are the Christians moving... So, so let, me, let, let me answer that question. Um, firstly, let's not pretend um, that, that huge numbers of Muslims are persecuting Christians, that aren't persecuting Christians. There are Christians in Pakistan. You said you were Pakistani ethnically? Is that what you said, or did I miss you? Okay, so Christians in Pakistan today, right now, have it far, far worse than Muslims in the United Kingdom. So it would behoove you to do better than, than talk about um, the discrimination that's occurring here to Muslims when Christian churches in Pakistan are getting bombed and when there are anti-Christian pogroms in Pakistan and where Christian girls are being kidnapped in Pakistan and forcibly converted to Islam, where Christians live as second-class citizens. Try talking about that, and then I will take your complaints more seriously. Because Islam teaches the kinds of injustice that we see right across the Muslim world. Because the kinds of behaviours that we've seen in Pakistan are not unique to Pakistan. They occur in Egypt. They occur in Nigeria. Now, Nigeria, Egypt and Pakistan are not united by a single culture. They're not united by a single economic system. They're not united by a single government. They're not united by a single language. They're not ethnically the same. The Egyptians have been Arabized. The Nigerians are African and the Pakistanis are Pakistanis. But yet we see exactly the same kind of reprehensible Christophobic attacks by Muslims against Christians. Girls are being kidnapped in Egypt. There are anti-Christian pogroms. Christian girls, um, um, Christian churches are being desecrated, just like in Pakistan. 
Same in Nigeria. Same kind of behavior. What is the one thing that unites the Muslims of Nigeria, the Muslims of Egypt, and the Muslims of Pakistan? Answer, Islam. Muhammad was an unjust man who did unjust things. And his followers, who really love him, many of them are doing the same. Now, I agree with you that not every Muslim wants to kidnap, wants to bomb, wants to desecrate, wants to persecute. I'm saying it. No, I, I, one second. One second. I'm saying it. I'm saying Can that... that? No, one, one second. One second. You, you, one second. I am saying... Because I am coming to your question, I'm just not buying in, I'm just not leaning into your victim narrative. Because Islam okay, is look, perpetrating look, more injustices than it's carrying, than, than, than the Muslims are facing in the West. Uh, I started by saying... Wait, 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 let me give you the microphone. So, yeah, if you can just hold it, you can just press yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I started by saying to you something which I personally have noticed. Yeah? That yeah. since my childhood there was racism. Now, you talk about things happening in Pakistan. I'm not in Pakistan, I don't know about that. I was asking you about what I thought was a swing that the Christians are taking towards the far right. Yeah? And you're talking about something, the persecution of Christians. I've not said that the Christians are not being persecuted. I've not even said that. And I've not made a narrative. Like you suddenly said, you've made a narrative about this and that. I didn't even mention that. You just brought that in. All I was asking you was, it's a simple question. Do you think now, currently, in Speaker's Corner, the narrative that is being presented by the Christians is leaning towards or helping the far right? Okay. That was all I was So, so now, 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 let me re now, now let me reply to that because I wanted to demonstrate that, that there is a discourse about Islamophobia. And Islamophobia is real. There are really people who hate Muslims just because they're Muslim. And it's wrong. And I'm against them. Okay? But criticisms of Islam are not equivalents to Islamophobia. Criticisms of Muhammad are not equivalents to Islamophobia. And calling out Muslims for their inconsistency in talking about Islamophobia is not Islamophobic. Christians sit across the entire political spectrum, left and right. And it, I think it would be too much to say, actually, that, that Christians are swinging to the right. Actually, the evidence would indicate otherwise. Most Christians are, are naturally left-wing because most Christians politically express themselves through concern for the poor, which is a left-wing narrative. But I am actually advocating that Christians come up with a politics that is neither governed by right-wing narratives nor left-wing narratives. It's governed by a Christian narrative, one of Christian solidarity. Which means that we don't criticize Jainism for its injustices against Christians because Jainists don't carry out injustices against Christians. Jainism doesn't teach injustices against Christians. But Islam is a tyrannical, violent religion whose doctrines teach that I, my, the value of my life is half that of yours. And the only reason for that is because I'm a Christian and you're a Muslim. Now let me ask you this question. Let's do a thought experiment with me. Let's pretend that a right-wing government came to power across the entire Western Hemisphere and started to impose laws on, Islam, on Muslims that said things like this. That if you convert to Islam, you'll be executed. That um, Muslim men couldn't marry Christian women, but Christian men could marry Muslim women. That um, Muslims had to pay a special tax, and if they didn't pay this special tax, that their property, their life and their families would all become forfeit and could either be killed or enslaved. If someone tried to impose those laws on Muslims, would you stand against them? Okay, look, so I'm not a, like a religious expert. I can't give a fatwa on things. But what I would suggest was that if a tyrannical ruler came into power and was applying tyrannical policies, um, 
Muslims, you know when you say Muslims as a singular, like for example, what am I allowed to do? And Muslims as a nation, what are they allowed to do? It's two separate things. For example, I could not resort to violent acts against that tyrannical ruler just because I didn't agree with what he was doing. A treaty would have to be made, I guess, technically, between the Muslim nation and that ruler regarding these things. So if he said to them, for example, like I guess the way uh, when the Israelites were under control by the different people that didn't believe in God, they would give them rules to follow. It, they were harsh rules sometimes. They would kill their, their males and let the females live and things like this, or they would take them into slavery. Um, just like the rabbis have their rules about how you would deal with such things. Under those conditions, you would suspend certain religious rulings, like if, like you're saying, they're saying we're going to take your females and we're not going to let you have them. Does that mean a person, like for example, I'll, I'll run it as a thought experiment. Let's say I'm in my house and the tyrannical king sends an army or whatever and says, give me your wife because she's mine now, under the rule of the land. Now because I know... you didn't pay your tax. Yeah, because I didn't pay my tax. Now I know that I can oppose him singularly. Like I can get my sword wherever I have and try to stop the soldiers. Most likely I come, they'll kill me. And instead of just taking my daughter, they might burn the whole house down and take the whole family into slavery. Whatever rule they have, anyone opposes them. You're not answering my question. Well, I'm trying to get to it. So, if it was something like that, like what you say, then the answer is that because a man doesn't have that kind of power or authority to oppose those things, he has to stand aside. You can't really say anything about that. Okay. So, I, 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 it didn't escape my notice that you equivocated on the question. And... Um, I don't think I don't think it will I don't think it will escape the people that are going to watch this on YouTube that you equivocated on the question because I asked you if someone imposed the law on Muslims that Muslims according to Sharia law would impose upon Christians would you oppose them and you equivocated on that question well you'll just have to wait so the the, the fact of the matter is I think so I'm going to ask you again do you think that Muslims including yourself would call Islamophobic laws that said, if you convert to Islam, we will kill you. If you don't pay this special tax that no one else has to pay, we're going to take your land, your property, and your family, and maybe enslave you, maybe kill you. And that your churches, for instance, couldn't, so, so that you couldn't, you couldn't perform the Adan, that your mosques had to be lower than churches, these are the kinds of laws that Christians have suffered under Islam for 1400 years. These is the kind of persecution that Christians still suffer under Islamic rules. In Egypt, the Christians must apply directly to the president to repair their church roofs, which means that many churches don't get the repairs. It's a legal ruling. It's a legal ruling. It's a legal ruling imposed on Christians because they're Christian, not Muslim. It's a way of degrading them because that means that legally they can't perform repairs and their churches break down and collapse. Muslims don't have to go through those hoops. They can just get on with the do, do the repairs. When Christians repair their churches illegally, if someone, some Muslim decides to report them to the authorities, the authorities could potentially come round and damage the church, even tearing it down. So this is the kind of rules that, Mus that Christians live under today. And Islam is the source of those kinds of rules. So let me ask you again. If we imposed upon you, and by the way, I want to stress, I don't think that every Muslim follows Islam. There are many good Muslims who are good Muslims precisely because they don't follow Islam. I only have a problem with the Muslims that are trying to be like Muhammad because Muhammad was a despicable man and the more you imitate him, the more despicable you become. That yeah. No well, that was not my condition. I, I, I yeah. That's unlawful for me to talk if you're going to insult. Well, there you go. And this is the thing. Muslims insult our religion. I, you I, mock... I, I trust me. You, Muslims insult. We've got it on camera plot, lots of time. Muslims mock the Christian I faith. Ask well, you need to go and speak to all the Muslims. I'm sorry, but no, I'm not going to. You, you. He is a despicable prophet. What would you call a man that legitimizes rape? 
But we can't go into it because it's insulting. Why is that insulting? If Mohammed no, did it. No, you said, listen. I'll, 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 like, I'll if, your yeah, if you word it like this, if you say to me, look, your prophet said this thing, I can try to respond to it. But despicable this, pedophile that. This is what I'm, I'm trying to speak against. I don't like this kind of wording, you know. And me personally, you speak as corner, you can say what you like, but I'm just saying with me personally, just, you know, my, my, my fuse just goes and I can't, you know, I start stuttering, let's put it that way. You know what I'm saying? I like like a. Yeah, we, a we're going to have uh, a conversation. Yeah, you but, know, but you know what I mean. I'm not going to have my freedom of speech curb. I understand, I understand, but it's just, it's just the way I. You know, I don't, well, that's fine, but I'm I don't not, respond well to that. I, I'm not going. If, it's my the thing the way is, I am. That's if you are upset by the example of your prophet, no. If you had said, if you had said despicable, that guy there, despicable. It's the same thing. Like, the wording is just. Like, it's it really not. You wouldn't. You wouldn't it gets get to me. If I called him despicable, you wouldn't get upset. No, I'd right? walk away just like the same. I'm saying uh, the kind of wording. I don't talk like that. Right. Let's you just know, keep it respectful. My... No, let's, let's, let, let's have a look. Hold on so where he sanctions oh, rape, you're saying? Discussion. Yeah, he sanctions rape. Keep okay. We can have a look at that. Yeah, let's have a look at that. Because I don't, I don't sanction rape. So. Okay. Just oh, to be on the record. Right. Okay. So here's the thing. The reason that, that I believe that Christians have the right. Okay. The, the, the Christians have the right to oppose an ideology that teaches evil. And I notice for the second time you haven't addressed my question. The question is. Thank you, sister. You're doing a wonderful job. Can I have one as well? You're doing great. Thank you. Well done. I'll take that one from my back pocket and I'll use it later. Thank you. You have a lovely day. God bless. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, Islam teaches despicable things. It really does. And there are many, many good Muslims. You might even be one of them that would never do the despicable things that Islam teaches. And, that and, yeah. Well, yeah, it is. This is, the, this is the contradiction that many Muslims live out in their lives. They don't actually follow their prophet. And they're better people for not following their prophet. They're better than their prophet. And, and, and for that reason, I have no problem with Muslims that don't want to apply Islam to the world around them. And I am opposed, I am opposed, I am opposed to groups or political parties or entities that just brush all Muslims with the same brush and say that all Muslims are bad. Because I know for a fact that not all Muslims are bad. As I've said again, and I'll say it one last time, there are lots of good Muslims, but they are good Muslims precisely because, they're good people precisely because they're bad Muslims. Well, you have to show them. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to. But I'm gonna ask you to address my question. If a right-wing government across Western Europe it sought to impose the kind of rules on Muslims that Muslims have imposed upon Christians for 1400 years, yeah, would you oppose them? Would you call them Islamophobic? Would you say it is morally wrong? Oppose them, call it Islamic phobic, say it is morally wrong. Okay, so I would say it's morally wrong. Thank you. I would say that there should be freedom of uh, religion in its entirety for all all religions. I would say I would distinguish between saying that Muslims are the ones who mistreated the Christians, and rather to rephrase that as tyrannical rulers under the Muslim Empire. You, they're the ones who sort of initiated these things. Um, I just as a as a Muslim, I'm a Shia Muslim, obviously. So we believe that since the time the Messenger left, Islam and its real interpretation um, was from the twelve apostles of Muhammad, which are the Imams, and therefore the most of the current things which you're referring to probably is from the Sunni side of the fence. Um, although you can correct me on that, but when you said what's my opinion regarding the persecution and if someone today let's say was applying what what was being applied i guess you're saying to the christians of you can't repair a church uh, you can't ring the bell loud these rules i think it was the treaty of Omar it you're referring to yeah. yeah those all conditions i would say that's wrong okay and uh brilliant yeah. so what what you've done there is you've condemned your own book 
you've said that your book teaches things that are immoral because if people did them to you it would be immoral and I agree with you which means that you need to find a better book basically and the thing is you clearly are a good man if you can see wrong and call wrong wrong then you're good or at least you're better than what is bad and if you're saying that the kind of rules that we see in the Quran are wrong if they are done to Muslims then that means they are wrong when they're done to Christians and that means that you can't follow your own book I'm going to give you an example and what you need to do is find yourself a better religion Not and I point at time to the time yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that better religion is Jesus Christ and being his disciple who you already believe is the Messiah it's a morally it's a morally correct religion yeah. so so you say it's morally correct but let me ask you this because in surah 424 it says this having in surah 20 in surah 423 it gives a long list of people you can't marry yeah. that you can't that you can't have intercourse with yes. it gives a long list of people that you can't um, have intercourse with it includes mothers your daughters your sisters your father's sisters your mother's sisters your brother's daughters your sister's daughters your foster mothers who gave you your, right your foster milk suckling sisters your wives mothers your stepdaughters your those under your guardianship those born of your wives so it gives this long list but then it says also forbidden are women who are married except those slaves whom your right hands possess so islam islam teaches that it is all right to have sex with women that are already married is that moral i forget the first point now there was something before that uh i'll try to remember it let's you remind me you said something so before I, I i said that in your last answer you had condemned your own book yes. because you had said that it I was morally it. wrong I okay has that helped yeah okay so um, I would say that when I was talking, I said my opinion, if you recall, and I was referring to a treaty of Omar, not the Quran. So um, I didn't say the Quran is sanctioning this behavior. As far as I remember, the verse I remember is about the God talks about churches and synagogues where the names of Allah is mentioned, and those who will desecrate them, and God speaks against them, and that's in the Quran. The Treaty of Omar was by the obviously the second Khalif Omar and under Shia Islam we're not really obliged to follow what he says. Uh, but in addressing the point you said about the Christians, I believe the Christians are on the morally high standard. In fact it represents the gold standard in morality terms uh, as was the teachings of Jesus. Islam is a bit different, it's, it, it's, not, uh, it's not really designed towards the highest moral uh, standard. And don't get me wrong on this one. What I mean by that is it legislates for a much wider group of people. It legislates for all people and in the real, in the real world, in what works in the real world. Now, I think you're referring to the verse where it says about, um, it's obviously illegal to have sexual relations uh, with a married woman which is universally true, I think, in most cases, in the law. But then it makes an exception. And I think the exception was at the time of one of the wars when they had uh, captured the wives of the polytheists, if I, if I remember correctly. And they asked the messenger of Allah that these, these women are married. What are we to do with them? And we know their husbands as well, some of them. They were concerned. So this is where this verse came down. Um, I believe the verse effectively is saying that you can have sex with them. Well, yeah, we're getting there. I believe the verse effectively is saying that in times of war, and again, I, I make it specific. I know you might not agree with me. I make it specific to that particular war at that particular time, rather than saying, for example, today, if like some ISIS guy says, you know, with the Yazidis, it's a similar case where he it's just a, storms a perfect match, actually. Well, yeah, the only difference I would make between the two is that I believe it is unlawful for an individual Muslim or even a group to apply these rules. They have to be applied by the, the accepted Khalif of the time or a godly prophet. If a prophet is not present, then such a ruling is unlawful. 
can we so pose momentarily? Just to get to the... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can we pause for a moment? Are you guys going? Can we take a picture of you? Yeah. We came here to see uh, Hudson to see today. Yeah. We, we um, only came here because of you. Because it's so good. I'll let you speak. Yeah, we've been watching you for a long time. I would say that when they were captured in war, although I t between me and you, I find it strange that the ladies were involved. I would have thought it was just between the men, but somehow the ladies were involved. So when they were captured in war, um, I guess the men folk were either killed or imprisoned, I'm not sure. The question is, the I guess it could be a tribal thing, but the rules the tribes had at the time when they were warring regarding women, as to what happens when, when you defeat the other tribe, maybe they, they had the policy that the women were, were taken by the, by the victor, by the victoring tribe. Maybe they took them and, and incorporated them. I'm not sure about that. It's my, speculation. My, 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 my but just I'll finish what I... Okay. So what I would say was that if a prophet who is inspired by God or has a direct line to God is in the position of a battle, um, and according to the rules of those times, what used to be done with the women, it was maybe a lawful thing to do. And if you ask me um, today, if some gang says we're, we're following the, the religion of Muhammad, let's say, like, uh, example ISIS, and I raid a town, and I say, look, these are prisoners of war, therefore the Quran says I can do this and this and this. What I would say was, as a Shia, we Shia don't really follow it like that. We believe in sort of the divine um, intervention of Imams. They would guide us to the right path. So such a thing would have to be sanctioned by an Imam. And because the 12th Imam today for us is in hiding or not accessible, therefore those rulings would become unlawful to apply okay, in the field. So, so what we've got there is uh, an, a backhanded admission that, that Islam teaches something immoral. Because I wasn't quoting a hadith. I was quoting the Quran. That's what I quoted. And without any prompting from me, you gave the context of what, how it was happening when the Quran verse was revealed. Which means that, and you did it in a way, in such a way as to distance yourself from it. And the reason why you distanced yourself from what your holy book teaches is because you're better than your holy book. And I agree, it is wrong. It is immoral. It is something that should be opposed. And if there is, and your, your comparison of ISIS to Muhammad is a perfect one. Because Muhammad had a war, he captured people, and then he allowed his followers to rape them. And then ISIS had a war, captured people, and then allowed their followers to rape them. And if you want to excuse it and say it was marriage, well, it's adultery. Because these people were already married and their husbands were still alive. So Muhammad sanctioned adultery. So whether we're sanctioning adultery or a sanctioning rape, Muhammad is wrong. Now, well, one second. And it's not just here, because in Surah 33, Ayah 50, just in case Muslims didn't get it the first time, Muhammad says it again, or rather Allah says it again. O Prophet, verily have we have made lawful to you your wives, to whom you have paid their bridal money, Though, and those slaves whom your right hands possess. Now, right hands possess is a discourse about those women that are captured in war. So Muhammad practiced capturing people in war and then having sex with them. So let me ask you to do a thought experiment. Let us imagine that a right-wing government establishes itself and then a civil war breaks out in France. And the right-wing nationalists are winning the war and they storm a Muslim stronghold. They kill the men and they capture the women. Do you think that those women would want to have sex and marry their captors? Should we start with that or the beginning part? Start with the question. Okay. So the answer to that is no. Um, but this is, I believe, what I was saying at the beginning. That in a tribal society 1400 years ago, was it understood by the women? Because today, for example, marriage is by love and by choice and it's changed quite a lot. Marriage has evolved for the better uh, into a more sort of better sort of institution where people choose who they marry. They marry for reasons of love maybe. But in those times marriages were a completely different sort of policy. You might agree with me. But it was more about 
financial security, it was about um, tribal relations, all sorts of different things which today don't really apply. They apply perhaps to tribal societies, primitive societies even now. But in modern Western societies, such things um, are no longer in use or they're no longer apparent. So these things might seem strange. For example, to say what happens to a woman who is captured in war. Like I said, even for non-Islamic purposes, when the tribes defeated the, the, uh, another tribe, it may have been policy for them to incorporate the woman into wives for themselves. Alternatively, what would they do with them? Based on, based on the kind of tribal society it was, I, don't, I couldn't say what they would do with them. If you ask me today, in its application today in the field, as mankind has evolved and changed, if someone attacks, let's say, Luton Town and kills all the men, and then decides they're going to take the women and rape them or marry them or whatever, then is that wrong? Then, yes, yeah, it's wrong. Can we apply that Quran verse today? The way society has moved on. In the Shia religion, the Imam is the link between God, between the Divine and between man. And over time, rulings are abrogated, they're changed. We believe in abrogation in Islam. So the Imam would have changed things or adapted them accordingly to our society. I still believe it is unlawful for a gang, whether they call themselves ISIS or whatever, to apply rulings from the Quran like this, which can only really be applied by a Khalif. And as far as I am aware, the Khilafat of the Muslim Empire ended upon Hassan, because after Hassan ibn Ali, it became a dynasty, it became something which passed from father to son, and it became about control and power and various other things. So beyond the first five Khalifs of Islam, I don't really take any responsibility for them. Okay. So, once again, because you have a good heart and a good conscience, you have tried to distance yourself from Quranic teaching. But the thing about the Quran is that it says that it's perfect guidance. The thing about the Quran is says that it's clear guidance. And the thing about the Quran is that it says in Surah 5, Ayah 3, that this day I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. And this verse is talking about things that are halal and haram. So the Quran is talking about things that are halal and haram, and it's saying that it is halal to capture and therefore rape women. Of which I'm happy to say you are not one of them. But I have noticed that you're, you, you have managed to create a, a, a cognitive dissonance between what you believe personally and what the Quran teaches. Because if you're not willing to follow your best example, Muhammad, and you're not willing to do what's clearly instructed in the Quran, what you're really saying is you want a different religion. And I agree. You should have a different religion. That religion is Christianity, because Christianity doesn't teach that you can capture and rape women, but Islam, the Quran, does. Now, you said that it was something that happened 1,400 years ago in a different time, a different system, in a tribal sense. And, and the thing is, if it was the case that Muslims believed, as we Christians believe, that there is someone who is going to guide us into all truth, the Holy Spirit. And who, that, that if you believed as we Christians believe, that the Bible is an expression of our faith, a, a distillery of Christian truths, but is not itself the source of the Christian truths, then you would be able to marshal that kind of argument. But you believe that the book that I'm holding in my hand is perfect, is clear in Arabic, and his guidance to mankind and it teaches something that you recognize as being unjust and simply using the kind of arguments that we use about the Old Testament to justify the Quran if you're going to use that kind of argument you've got to complete the logic we Christians don't copy the, the descriptions that we see in um, in the Old Testament where God commands them to wipe out an entire nation we don't do that because we see it as history we see it as an instruction given to that particular time, and we see it as part of an old covenant set of literature that is interpreted by a new covenant. But you're saying that this is the last covenant. This is your New Testament. This is your new covenant document. So your logic doesn't, your defense 
works if you have a concept that this is an old covenant document, but it isn't. You believe it's a new covenant document. And you don't even believe in the covenants. You don't have the covenant system that we do. So you can't marshal our defences to defend your book. Now, you're, so and that's why I reject your sort of tribal defence, because the Quran is given instructions today. It's not given instructions just for 1400 years ago. In the Old Testament, we have instructions that were given just for the time of Moses or just for the time of David, but because of the new covenant and the coming of the Messiah, they are reinterpreted and they are not the, the new covenant documents are, are the prism through which we interpret the old covenant documents. Yeah, but you don't have that. Now, you talked about the Imams, that the Imams are the guidance to the Quran, but Shia don't have a living Imam. There has but they do find right. The, 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 the living Imam is not speaking to Shia today. The living, some say he is. Some, but not all. The living, the, the Shia believe that there is an Imam in hiding yeah. who's going to come back later. But that means that he isn't interpreting the Quran for you. No. But all the living Imams that we had, can you show me where they say that? Show me one of the statements from one of the Imams of the past where they say you should not capture women and then either marry them or rape them. Can you show me one of the Imam's statements relegating the, te the clear text of the Quran to history? Giving me too many points, I can't even remember them. Well, just deal with the last one. My mind isn't what it once was. Fair enough. Just deal with um, the last one. The last one is, yeah. is that even recording? Is this That's picking up? No, no. Okay. So, we, so are we just we holding this one on? We can talk another day. Yeah. No, no, are you picking up? Yeah. Are you picking up the sound? Because I'll give this JC. Okay. I was so actually go. quite apprehensive to talk to you because um, normally you have the, you know, the tactic of saying things out loud. Right, this Muslim said this. I only shout if I need to. Yeah, yeah. But you also actually went all right. So, so my, my, maybe my, we can talk another day because... No, he's just recording. No, it's okay. Yeah, it's recording and it's going to go on camera. So what I want to ask you is show me... Oh, is he all right? Live and learn. Live and learn. Live and learn. So here's the thing. It's, that's how they learn, though, isn't it? Um, here's the thing, right? Show me a, show me any statement from the imams that say that this is that, 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 that you can't you can't take slaves and have sex with them or marry women that are already married. Show me one of the imams that said that. Four minutes. No, but I've not said you can't do that. What I've said is. So you agree with what the Quran teaches? No, no, no. no. Let me say it in my way. Okay. Maybe it's like maybe I'm saying it wrong. Um, the way I view Christians, or Christian religion, is that if someone who's trying to follow a morally correct path, in fact, a morally perfect path, um, all things being equal, it perhaps would have been the idea of religion. But given that men behave the way they behave, and perhaps the devil is involved, perhaps it's just our nature, a morally perfect religion. We're back on filming. Yes. Yeah, so a morally perfect religion in the field might not quite work. Yeah. They might just end up getting persecuted, if you see what I mean. Right. Um, so what, what I'm saying is what the Quran represents is a compromise on the one hand yeah. between a morally perfect religion and what works in the field. Yeah. So these kind of like thorny issues like what would you do with someone who's married but is captured in war in a tribal society. If you are morally perfect, perhaps you would Mm, I don't know, make a separate house for them, um, let them stay there and give them freedom to choose who they want to marry. Incorporate them into, the, into your society in that way, which would make sense to me. But these Arabs, the ones that are following the religion of God, um, similar to the Israelites who are following the religion of God in their time, like you say, they've done things or things were said to them, which according to the new covenant with the Christians, is not something you would now today try to apply or use uh, in the field today. The question is, back then, those things in the field were the only things that worked. And God was the one who was giving this, this information to them. Um, we don't say God got it wrong. We just say God knows what works in the field, what the people will agree to. For example, these tribal societies, 
if you had told them, okay, these ladies you've captured, take them to the side, make a nice house for them, set them free, and they can do what they want like that. This, for them, I think, it wouldn't have worked for them. Okay, can I reply? Yeah. So, once again... That's the reason. Once again, what you've done is you've distanced yourself from the plain Quranic teaching. And it's a, actually a testament to your character that you just don't want to do what the Quran teaches you. And that you're trying to relegate, and you're trying to relegate, you're trying to relegate a book that is giving eternal guidance, perfect guidance for all of humanity, for all time, to the 1400s. Sorry, to the 7th century. And once again, I agree with you. The Quran belongs in the 7th century. It's a 7th century book written by written by Arab Bedouins. And, and, and the reason why it belongs there is because it's despicable. And, and the thing, the thing that, that, one second, one second, one second. The, the thing is that the, 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 it needs to be relegated to the 7th century. And you agree with me that it, that part of the Quran needs to be relegated to the 7th century. So, so in terms of, in terms of, in terms of, and, and thus it's another cognitive dissonance that you've applied because you're trying to uphold on one hand that the Quran is guidance to mankind, but then when that guidance conflicts with your better conscience, what you're saying is, well, that's applied at some time in the past. But once again, I want to say to you, you don't have a covenant system. We Christians have a covenant system. You're using a covenant system defense, but you're using it against the Quran and the Quran is your New Testament literature. The Quran is the equivalent of New Testament literature. And so you can't use an Old Testament defense that we Christians use because you don't have the covenant paradigm that underpins that. And in any case, even if you did, the Quran is the New Testament literature, not the Old Testament literature. So, so and, and you haven't also shown me an Imam, any of the ones that you accept, that relegate as you want them to this passage to the 14th century and say it's not applicable today because every imam i would i would wager money every imam of the 11 or 12 or whichever version of shia islam the 12 all the all the 12 imams and their recorded statements not one of them relegate that to the past they all apply it they all believe that it should be applied and so, from your own Shia point of view, you don't even have an Imam to relegate this to the past. Now, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Do you want to come back on that before we stop? Uh, yeah, or do you no, want to keep it was, going? It was good to talk. I mean, do you want to keep going? Or do you... Well, I'll, I'll make a little yeah. statement. So, um, again, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is, um, consider a scenario where the tribal system that was in place at that time occurs again now in the future. Think the way I think of the Quran, that's again I'm giving my personal opinion, is that it applies it tries to apply the kind of ruling that works in the field rather than the morally perfect one. The morally perfect one is the one that we should apply ideally. I agree with you there. That's most of my agreements have been along those lines. But what men do and what men allow to be done and what God wants done are two separate things. And this is the main problem. So what I would say was if that tribal system came into existence again today, then what you're saying regarding the ruling in that verse would apply. Yes. But as mankind has evolved since that time, you see what I'm trying to say? Because like I said to you, marriage, woman, property, these ideas have changed over, over time. That Quranic verse, which you're saying, because the Quran, okay, I understand it, the Quran's a final testament, so we can't change the things that are there. But that one is a temporal one. It's talking specifically about, because I'm not a Quran only. I read the Hadith literature as well. It was talking about an event which took place where the Prophet was asked, what do we do with these ladies? And he said, we do this. Yes, the Muslims extrapolate from that that such, a, such an act is lawful even today. Some Muslims will, will extrapolate it that way. Like ISIS. Like ISIS. And the Ottoman Empire. And but what I have said, my position is, is that upon the, um, the abdication of Hassan ibn Ali, the Khilafat of the Muslims as we know it, the ones that had the right to apply these rulings, has come to an end. So 
those particular Quranic verses which refer to such things in the absence of a Khalif can no longer be applied. That's my, that's my argument. So you okay. can't apply them. So, so it, has, it has genuinely been a pleasure speaking to you. I, I, I know that you, you have an issue with some of the ways that I describe Muhammad, some of the ways that I describe the Quran. But as you can see, it, 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 as you can see it's completely possible for people to have a, a sensible, intelligent conversation here at the park without, without sadly, the Muslim hecklers that always come in and interrupt. And it's been a real pleasure with you. And just as a sign of, of how, what a pleasure it has been, I want to give you a gift. So I give, I give people gifts. This is a book. It's a series of reflections and meditations upon biblical literature. Um, this is by a guy called C. Uh, H. Spurgeon. He's a, a very famous Christian teacher. And it's just reflections on different um, scriptures from the New and Old Testament. Actually, there's something I wanted to ask you as well. Uh, well, we'll come to that, yeah, yeah. but let me just finish. Because, because Islam, and I think, I think for me, you've convinced me of a few things. You've convinced me that on this question, Shia Islam is no better than Sunni Islam. Because I've asked you to give me an Imam, one of your Imams, one of the ones you recognize, who says that these verses about raping and, and raping slaves or, or marrying women who are already married because they are your slaves, yeah, that that's permissible. That you, I wanted you to give me an Imam that said that that is a ruling that belonged in the time of Muhammad, not today. You said, you use that defense that it's the time of Muhammad, not today. But everything that appears in the Quran happened because something happened at the time of Muhammad's life. Every bit of it. So if you're going to relegate that bit to the past, why don't you relegate the rest of it to the past for the same reason? Now, the thing, the thing is, the thing is, bro, it, the, 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 there's inconsistencies in your logic. And there's inconsistencies in your logic because your conscience is telling you that this is wrong, but your honor won't let you follow through with the logic. If your conscience is telling you that it's wrong, then chuck your honor away because honor is cultivated by man, but conscience is given to you by God. And what you need to do is you need to look to a better example, a better example. And I would say that that is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is a man who never had any training in medicine, but they called him a healer. He never had any qualifications in learning, but they called him a teacher. He never marshaled an army, but they called him a king. Because of his teaching and his example, kingdoms and civilizations have been established in his name. And those kingdoms and civilizations are more widespread than those created by any army. He's influenced more people than any army that's ever marched any navy that's ever sailed. The, 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 the argument that you're using depends upon a Christian paradigm, the covenant system, and the idea of Old Testament literature and New Testament literature. But we're talking about the Quran. The Quran is the equivalent of New Testament literature. But you don't have a covenant system, so you don't have the paradigm that you need to marshal the argument you want to marshal. And even if you did, you're talking about your New Testament. And that is a problem that we Christians face. We want to do what our Lord commands us to do. But you don't want to do what Muhammad told you to do. So I, I wish you a good day. Thank you for coming and talking to us. If you want to come and talk again, it'd be great to talk to you again. And we'll, we'll do it just as we have today. How, and tell me what you think of the book. What was the question that you wanted to ask? There was one other question you said. Oh, no, it was this. Um, it was... Uh, I'll just sort of chime in with a bit of a reply though as well. Um, I, I believe in the verse where the God says in the Quran that the, the Christians you will find them as your dearest friends. This was before the wars obviously, before um, Islam turned to a different sort of side uh, in the beginning. The advice God gives us in the Quran is that the Christians you will find them the closest to you uh, and men of faith. And like I've said it before, I'll say it again. The Christians, to me, represent the highest moral standard. Um, perhaps were it not for it, the highest moral standard not working in the field, as you know, people have a mo mostly inclined towards evil heart, perhaps it would be the religion of choice. But I believe that God advises me in the Quran, uh, in the friendship verse, to take the Christians as our conscience when it comes to good and evil, because they have a very, very sort of good standard. 
Um, and the Muslims will sort of, I think, appreciate. I don't know if you... Uh, I'm using the stick. Actually, I'll get, back, I'll get back to my question if I veer off on a tangent. The question was, um, is there a good Bible you recommend? Because the, the only one I had was like a very old one some lady gave me. It's an ancient one um, from 100 years ago. So but if, if today... Um, if today someone wanted a good sort of copy of the Bible, the New Testament, what would you recommend? So, um, personally, I use the NASB, which is the New American Standard Bible. And what we mean by this is that there are, there are different translations of the scripture. And there are discussions amongst Christians about what, you know, passages are canonical, what books are canonical. But the NASB is a, a very well uh, done scholarly translation it's aimed at a higher level of reader so it's aimed at a high level reader rather than a young low level reader it's aimed at someone whose native language is english they used multiple um, um, texts latin slavonic ancient greek hebrew aramaic coptic to do the translation comparing the different translations to get the most accurate transmission um, and so i would encourage you to read that one yeah um, and just to come back to you on your comment about you, you quoted the friendship verse. And the thing is, yeah, the Quran says that. In the beginning. Yeah. But then the Quran also says this. Fight against those who believe not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger. And those who acknowledge not the religion of Islam amongst the people of the scripture. That's the Christians and the Jews. Until they pay the jizya, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. When it became warlike, yeah. And but like that peace -like version it became so. became warlike because of what the Quran says. But you agree the Quran has sort of, if you like, two sort. Of, you can divide it into pre-war and post-war. You know, yeah, yeah. and, and this is my point. This is I my would rather keep it with the. And this is my point. Order, right? You you are better than you're better than your book and you're better than your prophet. And it's a pleasure to meet you. God bless. Next time, maybe we can talk about some Christian talk. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. that Bible and yeah, I'll tell you what you do. Have a read of the book. Read the Bible. Come back with some questions. And we'll just talk about Christianity cool. and questions about Christianity. All right. God bless. So let, let's just do a quick wrap up. The brother has come down. to. He wanted to talk about what he perceived as the increasing uh, Islamophobic prejudice. And indeed, there is Islamophobic prejudice. Islamophobia is a real thing. There are people that do hate Muslims just because they're Muslims. And I find such people ignorant and stupid. There is, however, a legitimate reason to oppose Islam and to oppose those who want to impose Islam or to practice Islam fully on those around them. And that's because Islam teaches injustice. So we have to separate out um, Muslims from Islam and those Muslims who want to impose Islam and those Muslims that don't. And the, the reality is, in my experience, Muslims that don't want to practice Islam are the better human beings. The Muslims that want to practice Islam, the more they want to practice Islam, the worse as a human being they become. Whereas a Christian who wants to practice Christianity becomes a better human being. And when, as we see in the West, Christians stop practicing Christianity, they become worse human beings. And that's the difference between Islam and Christianity. If Islam teaches things that are unjust, then that means we can oppose it. And the Muslim was using the defense that Christians use about old covenant, new covenant. Well, that, that kind of defense only works if you believe in a covenant system. We Christians believe in a covenant system. So we can look at difficult Old Testament texts and we can say that is the old covenant, it's in the past. But new covenant te texts we apply, we believe in. This is the new covenant scripture according to Muslims. So why are they using an old covenant defense? They neither have a covenant belief system, nor even if they did have a covenant belief system, is this old covenant literature, it's new covenant literature, which means they can't use an old covenant defense. So they, 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 their arguments make no sense. And the reason why they argue like that is because there are Muslims who are better than their religion. But my point to you is, if you are better than your prophet, if you're better than your religion, maybe you need to find a better one. Whereas we Christians would say to a man that we're not as good as Jesus. 
We Christians would say to a man that we want to imitate Jesus in all things. We Christians would say that we want to live by Jesus' teachings without exception. And as we've seen, Muslims can't say that. And they can't say that because Christ is better than Muhammad. Christianity is better than Islam. And if you are one of those Muslims, like this brother, who doesn't want to do what the Quran tells you to do because you're a good human being, then that is telling you you need to find a better religion. And I offer to you our Lord Jesus Christ. Become one of his disciples, pick up the New Testament, read about Jesus and ask yourself this question. Why does the Quran call Jesus the Messiah? If you understand why, the, why, the, why people call Jesus the Messiah, then you would understand we don't need another final prophet. Because in Jesus, we've got everything we need. Good to see you,